ओके मैम सो वी आर लाइव राइट नाउ सो हेलो एंड वेलकम एवरीवन गुड इवनिंग टू एवरीबॉडी एंड टुडे इट वाज इट विल बी अ वेरी 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 इंटरेस्टिंग सेशन ऑन इंडस वैली स्क्रिप्ट्स एंड वॉइजेस इन टू द पास्ट आर रियली वेलकम रियली प्लीज्ड टू वेलकम मिस बहाता ओंकुमाली मुखोपाध्याय वेलकम मैम वेलकम टू वॉइजेस इन टू द पास्ट थैंक यू Thanks a lot for accepting our invitation. Thank you. So, our today's topic's name is the semasiographic in the seal inscription sheldom encoded proper nouns says semantic co-occurrence restriction patterns. And our today's speaker, as you all know, Miss Bahata Unshumali Mukhopadhyay. So. Ms. Bahata Unshumali Mukhopadhyay is a software technologist and an independent researcher originally from Bengal presently settled in Bangalore she researches the structural and semantic aspect of indus valley inscriptions and explores the linguistic identities of the people of indus valley civilization her first paper titled interpreting indus inscription to unravel their mechanisms of meaning convenes problematize more than 90% of existing decipherment efforts as it claims that in the script inscriptions were mostly written using logographic and semasiographic signs and thus any attempt to read them by treating those signs as phonological unit must be flawed her second article titled ancestral dravidian and uh, sorry ancestral dravidian languages in the in the civilization ultra converged dravidian tooth word reveals deep linguistic ancestry and support genetics published in the nature group journal humanities and social sciences communications seeks to partly resolve one of the most debated questions of the south asian prehistory the linguistic identities of indus valley population ms mukhopadhyay continues to research the semantic aspect of indus script inscriptions and her latest research paper that claims to have decoded certain signs of in the script is under peer review bahata unshu ali mukhopadhyay is a prolific and widely published bengali poet whose first bengali poetry thum shabd holi kobita came out at the 44 international 44th international kolkata book fair 2020 so it was a really 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 extremely pleasure to have her with us welcome ma'am welcome once again and let us not extend this <clears throat> this background more so it's over to you thank you uh, is is my ppt uh, visible now okay yes ma'am nice visible. um so uh thank you everybody uh, uh this is a great opportunity this endeavor by Uh, the students of presidency college and alumni of presidency college for uh, you know uh, having such topics of history and archaeology discussed is a, a very uh, like a really commendable thing i'm very happy to be able to present uh, my research ideas here so as uh, it's already uh, told the uh, my article's uh, name is a uh, title is the uh, sorry the presentation's title is the semasiographic indus seal inscription so semasiographic means uh, meaning uh, the signs were meaning oriented that is semantical semant coding semantic units so we will come to that later and uh, so i will uh, mostly talk about uh, the structural aspects of indus script uh, today and i'll not uh, delve uh, into depth uh, about the uh, you know semantic aspects uh, of the uh, in the script or the so uh, means uh, the uh, so called the decipherment efforts and all uh, so uh, uh, the main uh, points that will be covered today are uh, first i'll be introducing into indus valley civilization very briefly and in the inscriptions and then i'll discuss how the nature of in the script is highly deb debated means late alone decipherment even how the script was written that is not even having a consensus then uh, the problem in uh, most of the existing decipherment efforts 
and uh, I'll give a very brief literature survey regarding the methods used in deciphering other ancient scripts and the methods used so far in analyzing Indus Valley inscriptions. Uh, then the, my how my approach uh, might have helped in understanding uh, certain aspects of Indus script and the direction of my other papers, both published and unpublished, uh, the overall direction. Uh, which uh, uh, also explore the languages uh, spoken in IVC and uh, tries to decode uh, some of the inscriptions uh, based on my structural analysis. And uh, then I will uh, try to uh, briefly answer uh, two popular questions like whether any other type of scripts were there in IVC or not and whether we can try, we can at all read Indus inscriptions with the help of Brahmi or Kharoshthi scripts, uh, most ancient, uh, like alpha syllabic kind of script uh, found in Indian subcontinent. Can we use that for decipherment of Indus script or not? So uh, it's a Indus Valley civilization is one of the most uh, expansive bronzes, not one of the most, the most expansive bronze civilization. Uh, it uh, ha encompassed around 1 million square kilometers and had more than 1,500 settlements discovered till now. The civilization, uh, ha uh, the time timeline can be, uh, you know, uh, segmented into mostly three era. One is the fruit producing time or era where uh, the agriculture uh, was, you know, flourishing and uh, certain other uh, prim uh, the craft making activities, uh, they were also flourishing like li uh, pottery and other lithic crafts and all. Uh, then uh, there is a regionalization era, era where uh, the different settlements were advancing more and they were specializing on their, uh, the craft where maybe the raw materials are, uh, you know, local raw, raw materials based on that and other things. So that was, a, they're having certain distinct culture. Uh, and then there is this integration era, uh, which actually uh, is integrating all the settlements of Indus Valley civilization in a very interesting way where internally they were trading a lot and there's a lot of cultural exchange. And uh, that is the peak of the civilization, that is 2600 to 1900 BC. And then there is the decline of the civilization, that is uh, around 1900 to 1300 BC, that is localization era. So the trace of the civilization uh, was found in even 7000 7, BC. In Mehergar, in 6500 BC, there were uh, various, uh, you know, artifacts, uh, some quite advanced. Uh, ornaments and all were also found uh, even at that time. So uh, this civilization, as you all know, we can celebrate various aspects. Uh, they had such advanced urbanization. Uh, they had uh, outstanding drainage system. Even uh, today, some places of rural India doesn't have such a, you know, sophisticated drainage system, unfortunately, 5000 years uh, after the, this civilization. And we, they had standardized weights and meteorological system across their uh, settlements, most, mostly standardized. They had fortified planned cities. Uh, then they could uh, uh, trade with distant civilizations such as Mesopotamia and Persian Gulf, especially in Persian Gulf, there, are, there was a very co close trade tie. Um, Indus people, uh, many of the Indus traders virtually lived there as well uh, as archaeological evidence says today. They had made exquisite pottery. Even in 6000 BC, they used a metallurgical technique called lost wax casting. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, they have cast a uh, copper wheel like thing uh, uh, here. Uh, so uh, they could even make micro beads which are less than one millimeter of diameter. So that much advanced they were. And the in the script is the most enigmatic aspect of the civilization. 
uh, we mostly get the inscriptions from seals and miniature tablets. Uh, none of them are most, most of them are within a few centimeters in length and width. And generally there will be an iconography present in the seal. So we should uh, understand that the iconography and the inscription is different. So the inscription is the linear signs, small signs that we can see here. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, the iconography is this more picture like bigger symbols that uh, are present like unicorn and uh, a so-called unicorn, bull, elephant and other religious scenes, etc. And many a times a reverse part of the seal will be having perforated boss so that uh, they can hold it and stamp it on other, you know, softer soft, substances like clay. And then we have found seal impressions on such clay tags. And uh, so till now, uh, around uh, actually 5,000, 4,000 to 5,000, actually 5,000 plus uh, artifacts are found. Uh, that are bearing various in the script marks and most of them are seals, seal impressions and some are tablets. So how tablets are different is seal in seal it is meant for the impression and the tablets are meant for direct reading. So in the seal the inscription will be written in a reverse manner and in concave uh, way so that the impression becomes convex uh, and uh, in tablets, the inscription will be directly incised or sometimes cast as a mold so that the directly the inscription will be read from there, not the impression of it. And uh, many a times for the pottery vessels will also have the inscription marks. The inscriptions are mostly read from right to left. A few instances are there possibly which are left to right as well, but mostly right to left and a few are written in bustrophedon that is in a clockwise way you have to sorry counterclockwise way you have to read it uh, uh, the inscription so but most of them are linear and uh, from these inscriptions we can actually glean out around 2400 to 2500 distinct inscription lines so for example, many seals and tablets will uh, share the same, same inscription so uh, we will have some distinct inscription lines which we'll now analyze uh, to understand their structure. So the in, inscription lines we we can show you know we use inscription lines to create a database or corpus of in the script and uh, there are hundreds of path breaking scholars. Here I only uh, show the uh scholars who actually also created uh the index script databases due to which we could we can work on the script sitting at our home so uh, padma shri iravatam mahadevan um a world famous linguist arco asko parpola and um, brian k wells they have created a very sophisticated databases from the index script signs and inscriptions so according to Mahadevan's 1977 corpus, there are around uh, 417 signs and uh, this is a, you can have a quick glance at all the indescript signs uh, presented here according to Mahadevan. In other corpora, uh, the scholars debate uh, if a particular symbol is a graphical variation of the other another symbol or it's a, it's a meaning uh, or sound wise different symbol or not. So depending on that, uh, some scholars say that there are 600 something uh, distinct signs, uh, but uh, mostly like from 400 to 600 is the range of the distinct symbols. Like uh, for example, you might have a different difference based on different A or B uh, depending on people's handwriting, but then whether that is a distinct sign or that is a same uh, sign graphical variation that is also a question of debate uh, in some cases. Uh, so the main question that we always have to ask is, is the indescript deciphered already? 
If you Google the phrase decipherment of Indescript, there will be hundreds of claims, many books claiming the decipherment, but there is no consensus between scholars till now on that subject, and we'll see why. Uh, before that, I would uh, want to, uh, you know, explain certain um, terminologies that will be used and uh, to explain the ancient writing mechanisms. And I'll use use English uh, to, uh, you know, ex explain that. Uh, even if I'm, uh, you know, explaining Egyptian hieroglyphs, I'll be using English examples so that it is easier to understand. So in initially, uh, you know, uh, uh, people didn't have writing directly. This alphabetic or syllabic writing was not there. So uh, in ancient time, pictographic communication was uh, uh, there at, at a point where, you know, in rock, rock painting in caves, they could communicate certain things using different symbolisms and pictures. But that is not considered writing technically because uh, for writing, uh, quote unquote, there has to be a syntax and there has to be a word order. For example, subject, object, verb or subject, verb, object kind of uh, differentiation according to different languages. That kind of a syntax has to be there in writing. Some directionality has to be there in writing. Otherwise, we don't call it writing and pictographic communication was not that. So here is an example. Uh, if I uh, show a bee and a leaf and uh, then a bee and half a leaf and have an arrow with it possibly communicates that the bee has possibly eaten half of a leaf but that is not writing because there is no directionality or word order etc uh, then uh, we from there uh, you know ancient people had moved to logographic or writing kind of, where logos means words uh, grams is you know unit so word unit so uh, uh, if we, uh, as an example, if we give uh, these words like half, be, for, see, don't, eat, each as symbol, and then we can actually form sentences using those logograms, that is word units, uh, saying be its leaf or bees eat leaves. So here, if I am uh, repeating this bee symbol in a way, particular way, that uh, through that I can actually express a very interesting uh, uh, tool of minimum convenience that is morphological reduplication. That, like it is reduplicated and that is, that is meaning plurality here. So here we are not writing using uh, any phonological unit. We are not spelling things out, even though so this is writing because subject, object, verb or subject, verb, object kind of word order is maintained and a kind of syntax is there, additionality is there. So in Egyptian hieroglyphic, uh, they had a very interesting writing. So they used hieroglyphic, some of the hieroglyphic signs will be, uh, uh, you know, signifying consonants. Sometimes they will drop the vowels. In a few cases, the vowels will be there. So the consonants will be there and then there will be a sign uh, following them, which is going to give the clue of the meaning. So giving an English based example, if I write L and F and, uh, you know, draw a picture of a plant, then it might, uh, it should, uh, you should guess that this is possibly leaf uh, because of the plant picture and otherwise if I give L and F and then give this logogram of eating then it will may mean again loaf so that kind of a guest vowels are there so these are called semantic classifiers or determinatives so that was a mechanism of Egyptian hieroglyphic writing in Mayan writing they sometimes use the they use the full spelling but also used uh, the semantic classifier. So it was like that way redundant and robust. Um, in uh, some other, there are various other combinations of this. So after this logographic writing, that after that evolved, people possibly had this obvious issue that you, they have to, you know, uh, memorize too many words and symbols. So uh, as language always, tries to re ha having generative mechanisms. So uh, then uh, to reuse the symbols, 
uh, so that uh, with a very few symbols we can uh, mean more or communicate more we used they use rebus principle where a symbol which meant a word might you be used only for the sound value so here i can reuse the symbols as an english example like b and half to combine them uh, to uh, read behalf on behalf of somebody that behalf and b and four to read before belief for c like that uh, so that is called logosyllabic writing and we can make uh, this kind of sentences uh, uh, using logosyllabic writing as well for example don't believe beforehand here this don't part this cross that is standing for the meaning itself not for the sound but in believe part the be and leave are not getting used for be and leave but to spell out the word believe and similarly beforehand here the sounds are used to uh, sounds of the logograms are used rather than the logograms meanings themselves so that is a rebus principle kind of writing here also we have presence of syntax and word order so it is very much a writing so the problem is uh, because many of the civilizations have used this kind of mechanism in ancient time uh, people also claim that in in the script that this kind of mechanism was used but uh, uh, the structural analysis, I shall argue that it says that in the script was not written in a spelled manner. So yeah, the sounds were mostly getting used for their meanings only. Uh, that means they are not logosyllabic and Reba's principle is not getting used. The meaning itself was mostly getting used. Uh, so there are mean, meaning units that is semasiograms, semantic meaning, semasiogram or a word unit that is logogram. So I, uh, in the script or IAC is uh, not yet deciphered. There are a lot of controversies uh, regarding every aspect of the script, like uh, the underlying language, uh, whether it is Dravidian, Proto-Dravidian, Proto-Indo-European, Mundari, some say it is Sumerian, some say it is that distant Easter Island languages were used. And then huge controversy about the uh, type of the script, whether it is logosyllabic that I said before I explained, or it is logographic, uh, like Mahadevan, Koskiniemi, and others said it's logographic. And some others, like Farmer et al., they say that no no language was any way in, encoded in this symbol. So so many diverse you know opinions are still there, and uh, the problem in most of the decipherment approaches are that they are very speculative. They don't take account of the archaeological context uh, and other things. And they're often driven by certain identity politics, not always, but often. Like uh, some people would say that, okay, this is a uh, pure Sanskrit or uh, ancient form of Sanskrit. And they'll uh, try to have use various religious contexts to uh, explain everything. Uh, some others will say that it's uh, Dravidian or other things, etc. And another problem is because in Mesopotamia, uh, the seals were you uh, having mostly seal owners' names on them. Uh, uh, many scholars make a direct parallel and uh, say that here also such uh, names were uh, getting uh, encoded. And many a times the decipherments don't provide logically coherent model so in some way for some inscriptions even if that logic some way might apply the it doesn't uh, a, you know explain other, other inscriptions uh, so that's a very the extreme example of such a uh, you know kind of decipherment is given by the very famous historiographic uh, historian uh, 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 father henry harris who uh, who tried to uh, also decipher in the script, but that part was possibly not so good. So he, uh, as many scholars, he had a direct hypothesis that this script was, you know, uh, encoding some uh, Dravidian uh, language, and then uh, he uh, uh, was, you know, uh, directly, uh, you know, using a very interesting. <laughs> Uh, method that he will uh, sit, uh, take each sign 
and uh, say uh, what the sign actually you know uh, looks like so he's he took this sign the, which is like a crab so uh, he said that okay in uh, dravidian languages uh, crab is called nand so because it is right to left script so we will now rotate that uh, sound also making it danan and because uh, in another uh, crab like symbol of in the script which doesn't have the so called crab tentacles i will take out the last syllable from danan making it nan so see uh, directly he got a sound uh, for that particular symbol i don't know how from a dream maybe and see so saying that in dravidian languages uh, this nan means good so this means good so asko parpola had you given this example in his book as a um a uh, bad example of decipherment effort and uh, so his way of decipherment then went like this so according to him one seal read that uh, the mother of the middle of the year walking ant like uh, another seal according to him is reading there is no feast in the place outside the country of the minas of the three fishes of the despised country of the woodpecker so who knows what these sentences really mean and why indus valley people being so advanced in everything would take such a pain to write such gibberish on their seals and use them in commercial context so uh, the problem here is that many a times we try to directly interpret ancient symbolism with our modern speculations and that's uh, really risky for example uh, if you see how ancient people thought that's very different from how we have use our symbolism uh, for example in ahmes papyrus of egyptian uh, 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 egypt one egyptian mathematical document of 1650 bce uh, we have uh, very interesting mathematical notations used so here the plus or addition will be shown with a pair of legs uh, which is walking towards a house so house was called par so addition was more like a uniting thing so it was also called par and the subtraction or minus was symbolized with a lay with legs uh, going away from the house so that is a symbolism if we do, didn't know the other context of the mathematical papyrus and if we didn't already know, uh, know that the decipher you should have hieroglyphic if it were not deciphered already just looking to this phrase like a leg towards house can anybody understand that is addition so that means directly interpreting it as uh, okay a man coming home will be very wrong so similarly in egyptian uh, uh, fractions uh, when they are you they are talking about mathematics but the symbols are taken from a very interesting mythological background so uh, the they are uh, they have perceived that the horus uh, egyptian god his eye was torn apart into pieces by another egyptian god seth and the eye was again put together revived by uh uh egyptian god thoth so the the different you know uh, proportions of the eye as when it was torn apart those portions are actually uh, used to mean different kind of you know fractions here which is very interesting so if we didn't know already how hieroglyphics is written uh, how could we have understood uh, why a particular symbol you know is standing for 1 by 16 so the, uh, similarly if uh, somebody comes from the ancient time say by time machine or something and sees our modern symbolism where we call this uh, mouse a mouse so uh, would they understand why we are calling it a mouse and if we try a logo logogram for mouse for this would somebody understand directly so that's a very audacious approach uh, to directly a uh, claim what looks like a crab is a crab or what looks like a fish is a fish so uh, the methods that were used in decipherment of ancient uh, scripts were mostly that um, 
for example, in Egyptian uh, hieroglyphics thing, uh, there was a bilingual or trilingual stone, Rosetta stone, where uh, the same thing was written using hieroglyphic script, demotic script and ancient Hellenic Greek text. So because uh, there are proper names uh, in the Greek part of the kings and queens, uh, and by uh, you know by uh, mapping the uh, position of those names uh, and the, uh, the cartouche like symbol where the royal names were encoded in Egyptian so they they compared the sound values and that is the uh, breakthrough that Thomas Young and then uh, Champollion they used that uh, breakthrough and uh, using their uh, you know uh, linguistic, you know, uh, uh, skills like uh, he knew Coptic and other things, so uh, he could actually decipher hieroglyphics. And then, similarly, the cuneiform script of Mesopotamia. Uh, first, it was also deciphered. The old Persian cuneiform was deciphered first. Uh, another person, Henry Law Rawlinson, he was uh, proficient in Persian and other Indic languages, and uh, he could decipher again based on the proper names written in that script and uh, in a, uh, you know, a, multi a trilingual inscription called Bisitun inscription. And when that was in, again uh, deciphered, based on that, Akkadian uniform was again deciphered using uh, proper names and all and comparing them in a bi uh, you know, multilingual documents. So uh, another ancient script called Linear B, which is a Greek script, it was, that it was also deciphered uh, 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 based on a very important methodologies where uh, Miss Alice Cobor, a linguist and classicist, she did extensive statistical analysis and uh, use of linguistics to show that uh, the linear B used some inflected language and which signs and their combinations, how uh, that uh, that showed some linguistic syntax. And uh, she actually didn't have computer that time. So she cut uh, 180,000 handmade cards for doing a computer like analysis manually. And uh, during World War II, she didn't have paper. So she used, uh, she was an extensive smoker. So she used her cigarette uh, packets uh, for that purpose. So that was the kind of dedication. And be, uh, based on her breakthrough and, uh, um, you know, great um, you know, insight and a statistical, great statistical methods, um, you know, Michael Ventris uh, had actually deciphered linear B. Uh, this is a cryptographic grid used by Ventris, uh, where he uh, through which he actually uh, broke the code. So the problem is that in the script has failed this common ep epigraphic approaches. So decide uh, and um, uh, possibly it needed uh, the knowledge of this ancient language or uh, you know phonetics and all didn't yet you know um, you know yield much result. So the major factors in commoding decipherment is are the absence of bilingual texts, uh, extreme brevity of the inscription. The inscriptions are not long enough so that some kind of natural language processing uh, thing uh, can work on that. And very few inscriptions are found, like 2,500 uh, in distinct inscription lines are mostly there. Uh, and then there is a poor chronological control. One inscription, which is possibly 700 years old, and another inscription, they are kept in the same way in the database. So that evolution of the script is not very well documented. Uh, the way the databases were made and the excavations were, you know, done. So uh, these issues uh, have a lot of problem. Uh, sorry, cause a lot of problem for the decipherers, but. Uh, uh, the very few points of consensus in uh, for industry researchers, uh, one of them is the direction of writing. Most of them, most of us agree that is mostly top to bottom, right to left. The left par uh, part is always, you know, crumbled when there is less space. So uh, as they were habituated from writing right to left, that that was the reason. And uh, there is a functional homogeneity, like of terminal signs, like the signs that occur at the end of the inscriptions mostly, 
that, that they have a similar function and that there are some numerical signs and that the inscriptions can be you know segmented into certain parts like initial medial terminal those things are only of the point of consensus everything else is completely controversial and debated so uh, there are various interesting uh, uh, work on in the script uh, i would like to talk about one in, uh, some interesting uh, mathematical application uh, done by uh, rajesh peenar rao ranuja adhikari et al uh, who tried uh, to use some novel statistical and mathematical uh, methods to uh, argue that the script was encoding language in some way there was syntax in the script uh so coming to my research the present scope is there are two uh, three things mainly uh that is uh how in the script conveyed meaning was it like logographic semiographic or something else and how the uh, symbols were interacting with each other to convey meaning that was my first paper published in 2019 that didn't talk about any speculation or decipherment uh then uh, the what meanings are conveyed that is more decipherment related thing that i am currently working on so i'll give possibly a few uh, over overview of that uh, but not go very much in detail with that's not published yet and then what kind of languages were spoken in ibc i'm not talking of the scripts underlying language only the ibc languages that is also published recently and i have claimed that ancestral dravidian languages were one of uh, the languages spoken by a significant population of indus valley though other languages sure would possibly uh, were there so it was it's very difficult to claim that only one type of language was spoken across one square kilometer expanse and my first paper as i said uh, that uh, focuses on how in the inscriptions have conveyed meaning not on the why uh, what kind of part what meaning part and the methodology i have used uh, is not um, uh, any machine learning and all but i have used this supervised manual feature engineering if you if you go for the jargon uh, in a plain words uh, looking at the signs and their uh, graphemic like visually how they are made what are the components and all how they are visually resemble each other some of them and how they combine with each other that is their position and the positional statistical behavior i have uh, said that okay these are the features of certain uh, signs like this sign looks like this sign and this sign comes before or after this sign very frequently those kind of features using them uh, so we okay then this sign might be having a similar function with that another sign this kind of features we have i have used to classify the signs and this very basis uh, will possibly you help a lot in prospective decipherment so my own decipherment efforts builds a lot on the structural part so in the inscriptions were mostly uh, taken from seals so as i as you can see from the pie chart seals and seal impressions some are miniature tablets made of faience steatite and all uh, or uh copper sometimes and a few are also taken from ivory rods uh, most of them are only miniature only the dholavira uh, so called sign board is the only example till now where we have a bigger um, representation of in the signs and inscriptions so uh what i will uh, argue in my research thing is that uh, in the inscription in, in the inscribed objects were formalized data carriers so what are formalized data carriers say uh, modern day uh, revenue or fiscal stamps or currency coins or say trade permits commercial licenses these are formalized data carriers means there is a formal structure that we define for them and they encode meaning for a specific domain they are not encoding meaning of a general narrative so uh, this term was first used by sumerologists to describe the proto cuneiform administrative tablets 
uh, and I will say why I am calling index inscriptions, uh, inscribed, in, inscribed objects as formalized data carriers. So there are various uh, internal evidence, like structure if we compare, see, uh, if we compare these stamps, this Ashoka Stambha national emblem, that uh, gives the identity of the issuer. Here we have say unicorn, elephant or tiger kind of uh, animals feature like this iconography and that there is a fixed position of this iconography in a former as a carrier, like So then uh, there will be the information will be having also a very fixed position, right? There will be, a, you know, predefined format and uh, the inscriptions will be very formulaic, very, if, in a very simple term. If you see here, the rupees 10, rupees 20, rupees 50, here this rupees part is the constant and these chain parts are changing a particular formula to give the denominational value here also you see i'm not saying uh, these are meaning wise similar i'm just saying the format is very similar where you know certain signs will come at the terminal part or initial part and other signs very uh, you know you can predict which kind of signs will come in the initial part uh, of the thing so there's a very pretty much formulaic structure, then there will be this obverse reverse differentiation, uh, which in this, so our coins, certain information will be on the obverse part, some will be in the reverse part, that is also seen in indusil tablets, you know, only the reverse part often will have this say, rimless jar like sign with, you know, this numerical uh, symbols. And uh, the, the previous, the uh, obverse part will have a different type of inscription. So, uh, so this obverse reverse differentiation we also see in uh, uh, ancient protocuniform administrative tablet, where the, uh, the the say the obverse part might say this this much you know barley, this much of wine, this much of beer is getting, uh, uh, is involved in a particular transaction. And the reverse part will have the sum of that, like five, five uh, unit of barley, 10 unit of uh, barley, then here it will be 15 unit of barley like that. So this obverse reverse differentiation is there. Then uh, it was a very expensive painstaking process so that the seals and tablets were made durable and are portable. That means they the people had to uh, you know easily be able to carry them along. And uh, this expensive painstaking processes uh, like to they had to collect uh, very expensive materials like fans, steatite, and copper through complex trade networks. They will green melt cart those materials, make a paste of it. Then you know they will. Uh, you know, make it heat it up to 900, 900 degrees centigrade or more to attain durability. So that is very much, you know, similar to the way we mint coins or, you know, this stamp so that there is no counterfeiting possible that durable and the security features are there in a particular style only the uh, bull or the unicorn or the elephant will be, you know, uh, sketched or engraved there. So another very important thing is same inscription will be used across thousands of kilometers. So uh, here I have made a small chart to make the point. So say Harappa to Lothal is uh, around 900 kilometer Lothal to Kalibangan 780 kilometer and all. And these inscriptions are found in Harappa, Mahanjudara, Lothal. Uh, this is found in Harappa, Mahanjudara, Lothal. This is found in Harappa, Mahanjodaro, Chanhudaro. So that means that was a standardized thing. So in the seal, you are having a standardized, and it's a seal by definition is saying that there is a rule and the seal when it is stamped, it, somebody is saying that you, you, they are either authenticating that this is this or saying that you have, you know, you have obeyed the rule. For example, a boarding pass gets stamped. Are regarding security features, uh, uh, merchandise will be stamped saying taxes paid on this, right? So this, that means there was a centralized agreed information abiding uh, regarding some rule that had to be obeyed. 
and uh, the in scripts script was same information was getting used in Harappa and Lothar, thousand kilometers at, at that time is a very huge distance. So archaeological context is mostly that the, see, the seals are found near craft areas where things are getting made, ornaments are getting made, jewelry uh, or other you know pottery specialized uh, things are uh, you know getting made, and the seals are quite often found along with weight, which is very important. So according to the, my next research uh, using various other things claim that the seals and uh, these are these were used in taxation and trade control so in the script uh, so this in the weights according to jonathan mark kenoyer these weights are very much used in taxation of you know precious commodities and um, so there were some other volume based uh, measurement system also possibly there were because with our perishable we couldn't find it but whenever the weights are there similar places seals are also found that means whenever somebody has to measure something on maybe you know measuring a commodity and uh, at the very gate of the fortified city so as much uh, later Arthashastra said of, about the ancient traditional uh, you know, custom that at the fortified uh, city's gate, you have to pay, put customs officer who will be measuring something, weighing something, the commodities, and then accordingly have some tax and teeth collected. Then only they, the, they can enter or exit the gate. So in this uh, valley, the gates were mostly used for this trade control, not uh, not for any other. In, um, mostly not for the you know to fend off the enemy and all. They were not that robust. So mostly for trade, taxation and trade control. And in those places with those equipments, only seals are found. So if we put all this together information in a mind map, we uh, understand that the seals and inscript, uh, tablets, the encryption was used in a highly commercial context where bureaucracy and mensuration or metrology played a very important role. And uh, the seals and uh, inscriptions of seals and tablets have a very interesting thing that even if they are formalized data carriers, they can have if, uh, both type of syntaxes. One is they because they are formalized data carriers, they'll have a document specific syntax. So in a stamp or coin, whether uh, we write the par in the par word India in the top or the bottom is not uh, having a linguistic uh, syntax, right? Uh, that is a document specific uh, format that, okay, the issuing country will be written in the obverse top and, you know, the date of issue will be written in the reverse at the bottom. So uh, similarly, uh, th there will be uh, document specific syntaxes in the script and all also, but there will be linguistic syntax even in the very small narrow scope of a formalized data carrier. For example, uh, uh, you you see certain con uh, you know revenue stamps where the underlying language is say English or uh, other Indo-European languages where adjectives come before noun. Okay, so these languages use adjectives before noun like good boy, not boy good, right? So similarly, then the numeral adjective like five rupees will come in this format that five will, uh, the numeral adjective will precede the noun that is rupees. Uh, but in other languages like Italian or Romanian languages, we have post nominal adjective. So adjectives come after noun. Now the stamps will say colony Italiane, uh, poste Vaticane. That means here, in, even in this very small scope, we can see a uh, linguistic syntax, right? So Lear 30, not 30 Lear, right? So that means in, in the script also, we can actually have both document specific syntax and, you know, linguistic syntax. and I will show later uh, as I uh, go, uh, see, show you the structure of the script that uh, different part of the inscriptions were encoding different type of information. For example, if I uh, show the ration coupons of you know modern US, uh, you know at the time of Second World War, these were is issued. 
So if you see that this ration coupon thing will be written in this place, then there will be a four conjunction, then there will come five pounds, 20 points, 20 points, uh, or say 10 pounds like that, that value of the coupon. And then uh, which kind of commodity is you know obtainable by that, like sugar, carbon credits, meat, fat, fish, cheese, or processed food. So that means each position, if you see part A, part B, and to part G, the name of country, the name of the authorizing entity, then there is a connective conjunction, a purpose of the document, each part will be encoding a particular type of in information that is because of the document specific format. So I will show how index script has a very parallel kind of thing where different parts will be encoding different type of information. So based on my structural analysis, I will, I will say that uh, I have classified certain signs together. So say I'm not here in the first paper, I didn't go for any speculation. So I said that, okay, sign one, sign two, sign three, number, if you are numbering those signs, uh, these signs are occurring in a very specific place of the inscription. And uh, some of them occur only at the terminal part. Some they occur just before the terminal sign. Some occur in the initial part before a conjunction. And some are conjunction sign that connect two different meaningful units. So I accordingly, they also should have similar functionality. So through that, uh, I have classified uh, the signs into nine functional classes and given them very abstract names depending on their positional statistical behavior, like phrase final. So I have argued that each in this inscription found on a seal or tablet must be uh, you know, obviously conveying a complete meaningful phrase. So the signs that are coming at the end, I am calling them phrase final signs. And they're also not, not only that, that any sign that will come at the end will be called that. There were various complex criteria uh, based on that this classification was done. I'll uh, uh, slowly, uh, very briefly take you through this. So certain signs will always come at the very end irrespective of the length of instruction. Here at the top, you can see a two sign inscription. At the bottom, you can see a 14 sign inscription. So even so, this jar sign comes at the very terminal position only. And so there are another set of signs which come at after the jar sign. But sometimes some other sign will also come in the terminal position. But I will say that they are not terminal or phrase final signs because First of all, the frequency of the dominantly being terminal. Another thing is I have in my paper shown that the terminal sign uh, have a very specific semantic scope because if you apply Shannon's information theory in a qualitative way in the meaning domain, if a sign is always, if certain uh, say information is always predictable, like it will come at a very particular way, then that has a very specific and narrow amount of information. So here the terminal signs must be the, their most predictable part of index inscription. So they must be uh, linked to the basic meaning of the inscription. For example, just for example, if the inscriptions are uh, shared, uh, talking about taxation system and recording some tax collection procedure, then the terminal sign will be related to some taxation category. I'm saying, I'm just saying that as a hypothesis. So they, they, uh, these signs are also semantically detachable from their pre pre uh, previous section, that the previous sections meaning don't directly depend on their meaning. So the one terminal sign will war, will come with various different preceding sign sequences or combinations. Then there are certain signs which are pre phrase final or pre terminal. So they, when they don't occur in an inscription is fine. If they occur in an inscription, no other sign will be occurring before the terminal or phrase final sign other than them. So you see this parallel inscription in this inscription, this kind of sitting anthropomorph jar and this comb like sign, they're together. 
here the moment a prefresh final sign comes this anthropomorph goes to the you know right so we have to always read from right to left so that means these signs have a very interesting uh, thing that if they occur they more than 90% time they will occur in the preterminal position only before the phrase final signs and some of the signs will have specific relationship with specific terminal sign if terminal sign one is coming preterminal sign one will only come like that in some cases a very interesting linguistic syntax uh, in uh, uh, in the inscriptions is the uh, existence of conjunction signs so you can you can see that this seal is having this is like border moon like sign a harpoon like sign or arrow like sign and a rimless jar and a bow like sign so this inscription will now have this part and this part combined so message one message two is combined here and in between an x like sign is coming so this is not a, a you know single pattern there are uh, various inscription where one part of the inscription occurs independently in certain cells, another part of the inscription occurs independently alone in certain cells, and in some other set of seals or tablets, they get combined to form a longer composite message. And the the sign that will occur on the left of the conjunction sign, so that there are certain set of signs which will occur only in between such different independent meaningful units they are as so i am calling them conjunction signs or connective morphemes morphemes mean meaning unit so you can see a very simple glance at it shows that this connective sign is here the signs that is x cm y pattern so the x part that will have a very specific type of sign you know here this diamond like sign this wheel like sign and this boat like sign they are coming mostly in the pre conjunction or pre connective part before that and there are other inscriptions which independently occur in other seals as complete meaningful phrases will be coming after this sign this you know connect conjunction signs and very interestingly these are subordinating conjunctions because their previous part and the later part they're morphologically very different the later part will have terminal signs the previous part will mostly not have terminal signs and among many signs might occur in the previous part but more than five only five percent of the signs that occur in the initial part dominate 75 percent of composite messages so a very few signs, these signs like diamond, disc-like sign, boat-like sign, cross-like sign, and the so-called spin pincer or crab-like sign, they will mostly occur in the initial positions in most of the composite messages. And you can see that other part of the inscriptions remain almost constant, and these signs only get replaced by each other. Uh, and here also you can see that this kind of a syntax. So these are co subordinating conjunction means they have a dependent clause which is the left part, left part, and the right part that is initial part is the uh, in uh, sorry sorry independent clause is the left part and the dependent clause is the right part. So for example, if we say that uh, uh, because uh, because it is raining, I am bringing umbrella, or if you say because I am bringing umbrella, it is raining. That sequence changes the meaning com completely, right? So in a subordinating conjunction, the word order is very important. And in this case, that is there. The initial part and the uh, later part of the composite message are distinct. Then uh, there are also some coordinating conjunction where say bread and butter, butter and bread, the meaning doesn't change. So some of the conjunction signs, the left part and the right part, they have similar morphology, like uh, the uh, terminal signs will be occurring in both of them and there will be no uh, specific difference, like this part will have this kind of inscription and also that coordinating conjunction part type of composite messages are also there. Then uh, I have called certain signs like crop signs. Uh, yeah, here in the first part, first paper, I did not talk about their functional scope, but 
in my later um, decipherment related papers i would argue that uh, they really uh, you know uh, they uh, really signified harvest uh, harvested grains and uh, related taxation uh, possibly or taxation uh, taxes paid through grains etc so uh, here we only say that these look like sheaves of grain and they have a very special affinity with their with numerical type of signs so and a set of stroke like signs in in the script have you know numer ha have a numerical or quantitative you know uh, functionality for example uh, different uh, number of strokes so two three four five strokes will be coming in different inscriptions uh, and after that the same sign will come as a possibly this is kind of some kind of a commodity and these are quantifying something related to that commodity so uh, in my uh, decipherment related paper i i'll argue that uh, these numerical signs are possibly taxation rates and because uh, they are not having an elaborate numerical presence so that uh, they uh, you know uh, they uh, uh, encode any ad hoc number in a data to transaction rather in a seal they say that possibly this in this rate for this commodity tax is getting paid something like that um so there are certain signs that are uh, my meteorological signs so they are also having some numer quantitative uh, functionality but the interesting part is unlike numerical signs uh, uh, they possibly also encode the menstruation standard for example if a numerical one is written before say wine or beer it will possibly mean 1 liter beer in modern time and if it is if one is written before uh, say uh, you know basket of you know you know grain we will possibly think it is 1 kg or 1 pound so depending on the context the value changes but in meteorological science possibly the value of the st uh, standard and also the numerical thing are both encoded and the signs are like this jar like signs with one two or three strokes are there so see, this is a sure numerical notation. See, jar like sign with one stroke, two stroke, and three stroke. Sometimes also they they occur in a very similar inscriptional context, like three stroke jar with a uh, you know sheaf of grain kind of thing and a jar, so four stroke jar with a sheaf of grain and kind of jar like that. And these signs very often also occur on the jars itself, like as if maybe a pottery vessel's capacity or contents measurement is sometimes you know uh, scribbled in in its uh, you know uh, body like that so um i will next talk talk about some enclosed signs so uh, there are certain signs where the basic grapheme grapheme means a basic you know symbol like the fish sign and all the basic grapheme is enclosed in a four stroke circumgraph kind of enclosure see the fish within a four stroke thing the diamond within a four stroke thing and all so very interestingly in these cases uh, from the combinatorial patterns we understand that the the sign in inside the enclosure carries multiple meaning for example the meaning of the basic grapheme will be carried because if you see this uh, the signs which will be normally preceding the a particular fish sign will also precede a fish within an enclosure and when the enclosure comes the terminal signs will go away that means the phrase final or terminal sign their meaning is also encapsulated in this uh, in a very succinct concise manner in this sign okay and next uh, what will happen is uh, 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 so the if if say a grain like sign occurs uh, before you know a particular symbol uh, after a particular symbol like this grain like sign will occur after this cube with a you know a stick kind of symbol its uh, counterpart will also you know not occur uh, uh, along with the uh, grain like sign so sometimes that 
value is possibly also encapsulated and the prefresh final science or preterminal science will never uh, precede in this kind of enclosure so possibly the prefresh sign final science meaning is also concisely indicated in such a enclosure so when the enclosure comes it comes with a concise combined meaning so some kind of a uh, very formalized me uh, concise meaning contents is done through the enclosure so i have actually uh, in my paper i have shown that if we in in isolate the inscriptions the, in the inscriptions there are various isolatable positions and the sign if that is occurring in that position it has to be a meaning related or word related sign not a sound related sign and in that way i have classified various signs as in different functional classes and just as a general meaning related semiogram or logogram the few signs that i could not classify if i use that kind of a stringent positional statistical feature uh, they are mostly not classified because they have a very few layers low frequencies some of the signs have occurred only once so inscript has this uh, way of combining for example even uh, in modern time the chinese scripts the way a particular chinese uh, sim graphic is created will have a different meaning components as well so this component this component will be used together to because they have a combined meaning any a time so inscript also had a very interesting way where it combined different signs related signs in a in a but uh, surely a meaning driven way and uh, but because the frequency is very less we did not classify but uh, if i look uh, with the uh, visual similarity of the classified and unclassified sign and their combinatorial similarities then we very surely understand that these signs should also be classified as semiograms or meaning units or word units not any syllables or phonological unit and not at a letter or a syllable and there are a few other so i i don't have time to go through them very uh, elaborately so some aspects that subtle signs always come together and that is more than the chance factor so they have a very particular close association uh, with them they are called collocations and i had um used a certain statistical methods to find out which signs should be for true collocations that that are coming and which are not really collocations and uh, what are the reasons of making that kind of a collocation so some most of the cases because some sign class and other sign class have a relationship for example the crop or grain like signs will be having a special affinity to the numerical signs so they will normally have make collocation so i call in linguistic some that is there are general collocations not a fixed collocation so in some cases uh, this uh, this type of a sign uh, you know uh, some stick inside you know a uh, jar that a sign will come uh, with only the three numeral signs so this is a fixed collocation because no other numeral sign will ever follow this uh, this symbol so that means here that is not based uh, based on the sign class relationship but a particular sign have a meaning relationship with that three stroke numeral and there are uh, you know certain cases in the script uses a uh, duplication of a sign a very few cases triplication and quadrupled signs are also used so we there are various ways this duplication gets used in language in uh, sometimes we to do uh, by duplication we mean distributive sense like jan jane jane mishtanna bitaro matlab sab give it to every person right so this jane jane is a distributive sense sometimes it uh, conveys plurality so uh, that is uh, possibly in some cases plurality was conveyed because three grain sign and a three stroke and a grain sign also occur in similar uh, inscriptions uh, sometimes but nobody can be sure directly what was the reason of duplication and if we if we use the sign classes that we have defined and you know uh, you know classify and encode the inscriptions they will be 
uh, you can very uh, very well see that uh, a particular sign lexeme or say meaning unit or word unit and a terminal sign or a lexeme conjunction sign uh, then terminal sign that kind of formula you can put to a lot of uh, inscriptions so the inscriptions can be grouped in a formulaic way and uh, now I come to a very interesting part that why we call that uh, why I argue that these inscriptions cannot be read in a syllabic manner so I should not say that this is one syllable and say this is one syllable this is one syllable so together with their spelling a word uh, why not because uh, there are certain very intuitive uh, you know reasoning that you can uh, give for example the, there's a huge uh, uh, you know positional uh, preference for most of the signs some signs will occur only in a connective position in between two meaning units some signs will only occur in the terminal position some only in the initial part of the connective uh, composite sign some only in the initial or medial part of a non-composite sign so when uh, you have such positional rigidity then that then that cannot be a sound uh, uh, conveying system because uh, we, uh, any natural language sound has a lot more flexibility we don't say that only this kind of sound will always come in the beginning this will always be in between this will always be at the end there is some uh, case there are some cases but mostly not secondly most of the inscriptions are very brief so only with one sign sometimes they're uh, conveying messages surely they are those single signs are word or meaning signs and then other uh, cases those uh, messages will have only two to three uh, signs almost 65 to 70 percent are within five sign long so that means by just by five symbols they're conveying an important message so very surely that is not in a spelled manner but even so people uh, you know more, many scholars also try to read them as uh, syllabic signs and try to see uh, whether the uh, seal owners names are written there the uh, problem with that is uh, uh, if, even you know even if you don't do not uh, think about the collocations so certain signs will also always occur together all that 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 cannot be a um, uh, phonological thing there's a very interesting thing called co-occurrence restriction that my uh, title of the you know say uh, this lecture talks about so co-occurrence restriction means certain signs will never occur with certain signs very interestingly, in the in Indus script, that co-occurrence restriction is shown between signs of the similar class. So if I say that these four signs belong to functional class one, they have a similar fun uh, functionality. These five signs belong to functional class two. In one inscription, only one member of that functional class normally occurs. So normally we will not have more than one phrase final sign in the same inscriptional unit if we have we can directly see that three different messages are side by side written in a longer inscription but otherwise in one inscription mostly only one phrase final type sign will be there similarly uh, the, the grain like sign that i showed before or crop like sign those signs only one of them will be occurring in one inscription never both Simba and uh, say to uh, uh, this other other type of sign like pre phrase final or pre terminal signs which have a different again functional scope they will also only one pre phrase final sign will be ever found in one inscription so this is a very specific type of semantic sorry co-occurrence restriction why in in language different type of co-occurrence restriction occurs one is phonological co-occurrence restriction that means in sat in different languages we have a different type of sounds right english sounds different bengali sounds different and depending on our way of pronunciation our speech production system we can't normally pronounce 
one type some sounds together like maybe a glottal stop and a you know uh, you know uh, labial sound like might not be we cannot easily pro pronounce uh, together if we are not buffering them or spacing them with a vowel sound say so certain so sounds will only come at yuktakshara right so uh, this very thing is called phonological co-occurrence restriction uh, that has mainly two or three things one is our speech production system how we can pronounce things whether it is very taxing so that we are we have to use our tongue like back and forth too much too much of may but energy we have to you know spend in pronouncing a thing so our physiology won't allow that so we will simplify so we will not put, pronounce those sounds together so or it is if certain syllables are very similar sounding for example pa uh, pa ba or da ta tha so if you normally will not make the same uh, a word with only pa pa ba right if you think of any bengali or hindi word what which only has pa pa ba because the that is a perception problem so from distance you will not understand you are saying pa pa ba or ba pa pa because they are similar sounding so this auditory contrast are and uh, this uh, mechanism of speech production these things make phonological co-occurrence restriction and in that case that co-occurrence restriction works only in the domain of syllable that means syllable one cannot work adjacent to uh, occur adjacent to syllable two the moment you make another vowel or another consonant cluster in between they can co-occur in the same a uh, uh, word or a polysyllabic word so this phonological co-occurrence restriction occurs in a very uh, small scope only in adjacent or near adjacent scopes interestingly in this inscription show that in a long inscription 14 sign long inscription or in a five sign long inscription if you cannot have two phrase final signs you cannot have two phrase final signs or if you cannot have two grain signs you cannot have two grain signs that means that is not working in the uh, system of adjacent syllables or adjacent sounds or near adjacent that is working in the whole phrase syst uh, phrase level right so that has to be semantic or meaning driven co-occurrence restriction so i give you an example you have some calibrated mugs right or calibrated measuring system so if it is for a dry measure you will uh, have the, some something inscribed like 1 kg if it is for a uh, say liquid measure in modern time it will be say 1 liter or 1 gallon now the thing is not if you are having kilogram you will not have gallon vice versa because kilogram and gallon have, have same functionality right they are metrological uh, value so they occur in the same way in this inscriptions but if kilogram is applicable meaning wise liter or gallon will not be applicable and that is semantic co-occurrence restriction in an script similarly for certain signs which might which might represent say some name of some commodity or item the you cannot find some other sign uh, of the same category because possibly only one item of that category or that metrological category will be applicable in that context and very interestingly when phonological co-occurrence restriction occurs they cannot have signs adjacent to them which are restricted in in the script when sign 1 which never occurs along with sign 2 at all occur in a few rare places they'll occur adjacently that means maybe they are talking about some equivalency that uh, say kilogram liter equivalency or similar kind of a co you know commodity equivalency so they can occur together if at all they occur in the same inscription so phonological co-occurrence restriction particularly says you don't occur together and in indescript if at all certain restricted signs occur they occur together which is surely semantic so this proves the logographic or semiographic nature of the script 
and the interesting part is when you think of the implication in a decipherment effort you see where a phonological way that okay this is ka or this is um, um, uh, mean like that in, in any phonological way it is like uh, something is getting spelled right that moment you understand that that either this argument has to be falsified or that is not a tenable uh, or uh, uh, you know the de decipherment method at all because uh, phonologically it is not spelled so that is the interesting part of uh, semantic concurrence restriction it can surely say uh, that it is not a mixed script so some people even then say that okay maybe it is mixed some are some signs are meaning signs some sounds are uh, phonological signs but in egyptian or mayan hieroglyphics when that the such mixed scripts are used uh, people cannot keep guessing so they will have a very specific format that okay this uh, consonant classes will be preceded or followed by the you know uh, semantic classifiers or meaning related signs so here for each functional group we have or uh, i have separately established that see this this group is also a meaning related sign because of the, their isolatable nature and all so because of that there is no space in the inscriptions other than a few collocations where somebody can still argue that there is any space for any phonological mechanism where meaning mechanism is not working and some syllabic kind of mechanism you can use so when even when sign one is sign occurring collocating with sign two mostly there because they are semantically or meaning wise related and then 95 percent of the decipherment efforts will go because most of them try to spell out the uh, thing so that is a very interesting implication of this i have only 10 minutes left so uh, i will uh, so i'll not go any more detail about the structural part uh, we can see that the inscription can be segmented in a very interesting way that i said different part of the inscription will have different information and that can be actually shown in this segmentation where a very long inscription will have shorter messages which were also the messages of shorter tablets or seals for me much like this thing like in some ration token you can have only for meat it is one only for fat or fish or cheese the token is or in some bigger token you can say okay this is for meat fat fish and cheeses that means uh, the other part of the inscription remains the same only the name of commodities are possibly getting included so that it makes the message longer so even in industry that we see that a longer message structurally is very similar to a shorter message only number of informational units are more then uh, we so if it is so then for sure the script does not encode seal owners names because it doesn't encode things in a spelled way so also it does not encode any name of a place also the same uh, inscription will be found in various places so that way also archaeological evidence will say it's not encoding name of a particular place and then my uh, decipherment paper actually decodes a few uh, claims to have decoded a few in the inscriptions which i cannot discuss here anymore uh, not the scope of that but uh, we have a very interesting question that whether there is a script in ivc that use alphabetic writing at all so if i am claiming that this ivc in the script was not alphabetically written did did our did not our ancestor know how to write alphabetically so the main question is uh, so I answer is first thing we cannot say for sure it was there or it was not there uh, we have not found any script does not mean no script was there because circumstantial evidence indicates that a very advanced civilization uh, they were so they might have other modes of writing and it's possible that some of those modes were used only in perishable uh, things like leather or you know uh, cotton uh, clothes or you know um, you know uh, leaves uh, that have not survived so a very good example of it is the linear b script so we know that greece is a uh, greek greek civilization is very advanced so people claimed that greeks were advanced but they didn't know how to write before linear b was discovered and you know deciphered 
So before linear B was deciphered, people said that Greek civilization did not know how to write. Interestingly, linear, linear B inscriptions are only found in some places, you know, the Iliad Odyssey talks about this King Nestor, so his play, palace, Pylos, the Knossos Palace, and some other Greek palaces in their underground only in clay, clay tablets, the uh, script is found nowhere else. Now, why did we find the script at all? Because, uh, as archaeologists say, the because of mouse or rats, that rodents, and because of fire. That is because uh, possibly in the underground part of the palaces where the bookkeeping was happening, uh, because of the rodent problem, uh, the scribes were not writing on their normal perishable uh, material like a leather or something, and they wrote in uh, you know clay tablets and they they sandwiched those tablets so. We, and at the end of an year, when all the tablets are completely copied to a more perishable, but that time is more, you know, in that sense, more durable, uh, you know, medium, they actually uh, reuse the clay to, you know, they again uh, took the clay and reused it. And so we don't get more than one year of bookkeeping inscription. So this very advanced uh, script, linear B, and it's a bit uh, predecessor linear A, they are not found in any other context. That means if that is, it is not for fire or rodent, no, we would not have known that Greek people had written using alpha syllabary and there was surely some other non-alpha syllabic predecessor that we have no clue about. So not having a script, you cannot say that it is not there. Same thing for our uh, ancestors. They might not have written uh, in alpha syllabic way, but they might have also which we could not find maybe because it was mostly on perishable material. Another thing is uh, people ask whether um, uh, this ancient Brahmi, which is mostly found in the Indian subcontinent, main part, uh, uh, this Kharoshthi, which is mostly found in the northwestern part of the subcontinent and also some way in uh, the eastern part also. Now, whether this Brahmi and Kharoshthi script has anything to do with industry. So the question is, uh, there might be a relation. Uh, for example, uh, in uh, Egyptian writing, hieroglyphic, that is a monument writing, and heretic, that is a uh, cursive writing done by the uh, you know, priests, they were in a very interesting way correlated. But hieroglyphic system was very different. A heretic system was very different. So different type of writings evolve from each other, take you know values from each other, share symbolism. Sometimes a word symbol might be used as an acronym in a letter. So acronym means a letter, if that word is a very popular word, that first sound will be the letter, uh, letter sound like that. So there are various ways scripts actually share uh, their system, but we have to understand that Brahmi and Khoroshthi, the way we have got them, are alpha syllabic uh, and uh, alphabetic and alpha syllabic scripts. So they are advanced alpha syllabary, and in the script is uh, log uh, logographic or semasiographic dominantly. So the, the the inscription that we are finding from seals and tablets, at least. So there is uh, no direct connection that you cannot read in the script by using. Brahmi or Kharoshthi directly because that way you are going to, you know, uh, compare between apples and oranges. So uh, that the, there are, can be a genealogical relationship uh, between the scripts as well, uh, but uh, you cannot directly relate them. So that this is a 5000 years old or even older system of mercantile script used in trade and commerce written in a miniature tablet in a small scope to encode meaning. And these are a full-fledged alpha syllabary, which is used to write any narrative that you want. So you can directly relate them. So that this uh, makes this uh, possibly too long and verbose uh, session to an end. And if you have, a, have any question, uh, you may please ask uh, now. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, ma'am.
thank you for this really really enriching session i am so much into it so um, before we move to our the questions from the our viewers i personally have a question sure so ma'am uh, as we found in the many of the decipher script incidents of other of like hieroglyphics or cuneiform scripts but like there's a something is a bilingual script and then it can be deciphered easily like in the in case of the kharosthi or brahmi we can see that so is there any case of bilingual script in the case of harappans or not unfortunately not found yet ah uh. that would have made the life of the decipher uh, aspiring decipherers uh, much easier but no yeah okay so let move to our questions from our viewers oh sorry i am am i supposed to read them and answer so upamanyu majumdar have archaeologists been able to identify possible counterfeit seals from mature harappa very interesting question i don't i, I have not heard about it yet um, possibly no yeah okay ma'am so there's another question which was sent by my friend yeah here is it good evening okay very interesting and amazing okay fine uh, which ma'am is there any evidence of cultural fusion from any part of the indus valley inscriptions ancestral dravidian languages in the civilization and all so uh, see uh, for to answer this question we have to uh, you know uh, i have to talk about my uh, my claimed decoding uh, which i should not hear because uh, here we are not keeping that scope there but so when i talked about the dravidian ancient ancestral dravidian languages being spoken in ivc uh, i have not touched the script at all uh, very purposefully because actually i believe that the script in some cases corroborated uh, the the uh, language in some way but we have to understand that a language and a script are very different things you know the same a uh, script can actually encode very different language so related the cuneiform script actually encoded different uh, mesopotamian languages so point is in in the script possibly the symbolisms were more important for example if you have a 1 million square kilometer expanse and if you are trying to establish a, a meaning system where a small miniature tablets where which are actually i forgot to mention that the which are mostly found in very commercial context like uh, i told about the craft making areas and all but also directly on merchandise so some uh, commodities which are packed with a reed mat and other clay they have a clay stamp saying something about the commodity itself so that means when a commodity is moving in between different india settlements maybe say a caravan is moving with uh, uh, so that the commodities are getting sold maybe in different markets and say different uh, places it is getting you know uh, having different seal impressions which is we see in lothal warehouse different impressions are coming on the same uh, com uh, merchandise you know that means uh, across 1 million square kilometer the people have to understand the meaning and when, th when there is no internet no phone nothing how difficult it is that means in some cases uh, the very uh, very important symbolisms that are used in ancient time will be used in that uh, you know in that sign also and that that means in uh, for example in uh, today's uh, time this white house right white house means a political entity right in western world so we if somebody tries to just depict a white house in a symbolism way knowing the uh, knowing the lang linguistic phrase that white house means that we will understand that is mentioning a particular political entity 
rather than uh, a house only so that kind of a symbolism my would possibly used so that the meanings are very easily understood uh, so that means that kind of a cultural integration will be there and if there is such a symbolism there will be that same reflection in that word many a times so when you are actually trying to decode in some cases the archaeological context of the inscription and the symbols uh, which are possibly frequenting in that context uh, and if you know that okay this symbol had this kind of ancient symbolism then and our languages actually use those ancient words for the same thing all these things together that confluence can actually help you to decipher so that kind of cultural integration will be there uh, but directly from a linguistic word you cannot always say that or infer that uh, would you please uh, would you please uh, explain the term zoolatry what do you mean by that or maybe i'll google about it <laughs> One moment. Okay, okay, understood. So, worship of animals. Uh, so, a very interesting question. So, I think um, again, only a decoding can answer that. But a very important part is we have to uh, we have to differentiate between the iconography and the inscription. So, mostly, other than fish and bird. Which I, which are represented in the inscription, mostly there is, there are no, in a few cases, a, a bovine animal is represented. With, so, which, uh, but I believe that is not in a religious sense. Right? But in the contrary, the iconography is very surely having mythological basis. Whatever religions uh, say uh, belief was there, so. Inscription and iconography are very different. For example, in our coins and all this Ashoka Sambha or in you know uh, pre-independence uh, stately coins, there will be Lakshmi symbol. So that will have a uh, that will be an em emblem of a of a particular dynasty or you know so, uh, their re religious belief. So in that way, the iconography was were quite religious and. Many of times, I think sometimes a sacrifice, uh, some sacrificial vessels are getting offered to a tree. Uh, there are there are uh, uh, gods who are sitting on a tree, and then some um, gods were strangulating lion. So as Arsko Parpola has uh, said that uh, we had uh, uh, you know uh, uh, similar parallel in Mesopotamia also this god Inanna. In Mesopotamia, who possibly have some connection with our Durga, according to Parpola, uh, that is Bibi Nani, uh, that is there in Afghanistan. So uh, they all uh, have a uh, relationship with a feline character, either lion or tiger. So we have here also some goddess, you know, handling two tigers and all. So in those places, your animal worship or zoolatry surely played a role because i think when uh, when they uh, the iconography were possibly related to the issuing authority of the seal say a particular trade guild or a sovereign authority who are getting some trade control or taxation on related things they had their religious belief in the emblem so that part has a, a zoolatry count uh, part in it uh, inscriptions possibly mostly use homonymy and metonymy. Metonymy is like, as I said, through White House, you are dis, uh, 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 referring to a political entity. And homonymy is like uh, the same word might mean two things, right? So for, uh, so the, uh, you can use the symbol of the more, like you, when we play dumb Sharad, right? So the same word, if it means two related things, the abstract meaning cannot be directly expressed. So the more tangible meaning will be expressed to the symbolism. I think religion uh, played a part in some of the symbolisms, but 
uh, I don't, I have not uh, found any zoolatry directly yet. There could have been surely there. Okay, ma'am. So okay. there's another question. In the cells that are found in Mesopotamia, were they different from those found in the northwest of the subcontinent? Could, yeah, actually, in a few cases, uh, a few cases they are different. Um, uh, there are very few cells in the cells that are found in Mesopotamia, possibly because uh, the, six, the the system that uh, the administrative control that were depicted that were no uh, exercise to the seal, they will not work very well in Mesopotamia. Mostly, maybe in only when a person is talking back to his you know, native counterpart, mostly that seal will be in use. So that is why we don't get many seals in Mesopotamia. Uh, Persian Gulf, we get a, a, a bit more. And Persian Gulf, the glyptic system was very much, you know, uh, very much influenced by uh, India's glyptic system as uh, archaeologists are, are uh, revealing uh, continuously. Uh, but uh, the difference in a few cases, the dif there are the sign sequences have been different. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, existing studies, uh, they argue that uh, see the sign sequence in West Asia in only, I think in two cases only, uh, two terminal signs were uh, uh, side by side used, and uh, uh, that is a very uh, uh, different, uh, exceptional thing uh, in our normal index script system. So they said that possibly different language was getting encoded because of that. I won't say so. So first thing is uh, how a person in Mesopotamia uh, is if they're experimenting in in with the glyptic way some way or maybe uh, in some cases they are not very familiar uh, uh, they are using it in some other ways different but in our vast inscription system uh, the semasiography and the logography was very prominent so uh, that difference i won't say it is because of linguistic difference maybe they were using some other methodology or maybe it is a very exceptional case or experimental case uh, i can't uh, i don't have any more uh, basis on comment on commenting on that okay ma'am so before concluding our today's session i have uh, one more question sure uh, ma'am in recent times uh, many research and many genetical studies shows that the Harappans are more related with the Aryans than the Har Harappans or the Indus people as a very separate, separate identity. And there are many researches in the way of the seals and the like the iconography or the writings on the seals which were matched or linked with the Vedic sacrifices or Vedic rituals in the many ways so if you are talking about this is a highly mercantile activities were doing through the seals and there is some other research which was showing it was totally on the religious activity so these are some two different and like paradigm paradigmatically different. different yeah so how like would you like to make me make any comments yeah. on this many comments <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. I will, so there are various things to talk about on this thing. One thing is this Aryan Dravarian dichotomy is a very wrong thing, I think, because we have this Vedic text, uh, but whether slowly, so in the Vedic texts also, there are very different tribes where, who are having slowly their uh, their own prefer favored gods are getting priority, getting less priority, and all those things have happened. And uh, then uh, the, uh, uh, we don't know whether some of the indigenous uh, system was also getting incorporated partially in uh, in that religion. We don't know. I'm just I'm not saying it is incorporated. So, so that means. Uh, this Aryan Dravarian dichotomy is itself a very uh, deep, uh, uh, sorry, is a 
sub, it should be subjected to even more deeper, different type of research. But if I just take the Vedic text and that parallel, there are two to three things. First thing is this Sena Chiti, that is a fire altar, Vedic fire altar looking like Sena or, you know, uh, uh, looking like a particular bard, who, which was used uh, for a particular, um, you know, yagya. So that looks visually like one bard-like symbol, one bard-like symbol, very infrequently used in in the script. Visually, it looks similar. So this is this bard-like symbol in in the script. It also looks like a bard and fish ligature. So people who talk about Sena Chiti don't talk about that part, first thing. Second thing, it's only a visual similarity. You have, a, if you represent any bard, like that predatory bard, eagle, and say that. So it will have a visual similarity. So say, thing is that based on that, there is a striking similarity. There is, I don't find any other symbol which is directly similar. So there is a cross, uh, hatched field like symbol so directly then a, then a researcher might say this is another fire altar this is this so you can give for an abstract symbol you can give any number of meaning that has no direct historical or archaeological context second thing is um, some of the scholars who are talking about this vedic symbolism used uh, they are saying that this is you the seals are used to as a mnemonic for Vedic text. That's a very presumptuous, very precarious thing to say because small seals, right? And the Vedic, huge Vedic hymns. Why would somebody try to remember uh, three three signs? Can you, can you really remember a whole hymn by using three signs, three symbols? So that kind of thing. Secondly, we don't get the seals in any religious context. You never get it in a, any grave good. Okay. So gra grave good, they have a burial system. They surely had some religious thing. The pottery urn should be more looked after if you're talking about religion, because the pottery urns actually have a very distinct symbolism, which are related culturally to burial. But seals are never used there. Seals are used in, in archaeological context. Whenever you have a, you know, gemstone making or ornament making system, you have a shell, uh, shell uh, making workshop. There you have specific seals and weights and you are having that in the place of, a, you know, uh, where you have to enter the city or exit the city. So when you are having in the, in the mercantile context, then you cannot say it's used was in a religious context, but a religious symbolism might be used in one small symbol. For example, in our, uh, in our coins, right? We are in our coins, we have the symbol of paddy or sheaf of grain, right? Because culturally a sheaf of grain or a paddy or wheat, uh, that is a Lakshmi or Dhanya, Dhanya Lakshmi and symbol of wealth, right? Or prosperity. So that symbol is used in a coin. Doesn't mean the coin is a religious token or a votive thing, right? The coin is a coin. So that is a problem. So when people are talking about imposing all these things, first thing, religious symbolism should be looked, up, looked at to understand the symbolism of individual signs, to understand their meaning maybe. Maybe in, in Egyptian system, a uh, beetle uh, uh, worm was used as a representative of mourning because our god, uh, 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 sun god, because that is the first insect that comes out. So that is a cultural basis. So that kind of symbolisms for each individual symbol, if somebody talks about that and some bilingual or cultural basis of that, that is a very tenable hypothesis or methodology. But if somebody says that the script itself was used for religious or to remember him, I, I don't know how you can remember him or, and, uh, you know, stamp, stamp those re remembering the mnemonic on a uh, reed mat on a merchandise. And when you are uh, done with it, you will also throw them, throw the seal expressions, the 
precious religious tokens uh, in the west or cesspit. So they are thrown. They are not even kept in a you know revered way. So we will never normally throw away our religious things in a in a particular cesspit as a you know wasted thing. So I I completely uh, disagree that the seals are used in religious context, but the symbolisms will have a uh, cultural and religious background maybe in many cases. That's a different question. Okay, so there's no more questions. So let's end our session here. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you once again for this amazing session. We're really enriched and yeah, some of our friends or some of our viewers told this to us. So we all are waiting for your next paper and hope your research will open that new paradigm of in this valley research. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you once again. Please stay safe. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. It was wonderful talking to you all. Thank you. Bye. And before concluding our today's session, I will like to announce about our next session. It will on 11th of September. It was a panel discussion or we have two speakers that day, Dr. Anindita Ghoshal and Shomari Chakma. And our that day's topic is Deshbhag o Parvotto Chattogram, Janojati o Tadev Pranti Kata. And we are really lucky to have Shomari Chakma with us, who is one of the pioneer or the founder of this Chakma Foundation in Chattogram. So please be there on 11th September and please stay safe all. Follow us on Instagram, follow us on Facebook. And if you like to share your comments, your research, please contact with us on Facebook. There's a, our email is there. Okay, so that's it. Good night, ma'am. Good night. Namaskar.